month uh, regarding the problems that we have seen in the past at Lincoln Hills, but more importantly, focusing on the future and what we're going to do to make sure that we have a state-of-the-art, well-run um, facility and program for juvenile offenders. So I'm going to let other members talk about the process that we used and to go through that. So I'm just going to take a quick moment to reiterate uh, what we read in yesterday's um, State Journal about what the plan actually looks like uh, that one of our members talked to you about. So the basic idea uh, is to say that we need to have a facility that continues to take care of the worst of the worst among juvenile offenders. But our goal has always been the same, to make sure that any juvenile who commits an offense, be it minor or major, has the chance to rehabilitate themselves, hopefully become a productive member of society, and do it in a way that also protects the public. Uh, we have kind of divided those young people into two different categories. A serious juvenile offender would be someone who, if they were an adult and committed one of 14 different felonies, would be considered a serious offender in the adult system, and then all of the other offenses that can actually happen. So those serious juvenile offenders would continue to be housed by the state, uh, in a number of correctional facilities. That number is not yet determined because we want to actually do more study and have an opportunity to look at the needs rather than saying we just know we need five or we know we need ten. Uh, but the most important part of the plan is to really rely on the success that has happened over time in our local county institutions. Uh, in my own county in Racine, uh, they made a decision over 20 years ago to try to send fewer young people to Lincoln Hills, Wales at the time, and SOGS, which is uh, the Southern Oaks Girls School uh, in Racine County, to try to do more programming and have a more intensive effort uh, with a county-run program uh, in downtown Racine. If you look at the results from that program, they really had better results in almost every possible metric. They had a higher graduation rate, they had a lower recidivism rate, they had a higher number of credits that were earned, and overall they were able to do it at a lower cost than the facilities that are being done at the state. So we know that other facilities in Milwaukee and La Crosse and around the state have also had those successes. So we wanted to build on that as our model as opposed to just having the state continue to run all of those facilities. So our basic idea would be that 95% of the cost of constructing or rehabbing any facility uh, that would be county run would be paid for by the state. Uh, and the operating costs, like they are today, will continue to be paid for uh, by the counties, but hopefully at a lower cost. We know in Racine, they do it at about 50% of the cost of sending a child to Lincoln Hills. So if we can do it at a lower price with better results, we thought that was the best model to build on. I do want to give a big shout out to all the folks that you see standing with me. Um, unfortunately, sometimes in our legislature, we don't have cross-party and cross-chamber collaboration until uh, potentially late in the process. Uh, I'm very proud that we had that in the assembly with our Speaker's Task Force on Foster Care, Democrat and Republican co-chairs. Those bills are coming up today. This is another really good example of people leaving their ideology and their party at the door and just sitting down to try to find a way to get to the best answer to solve a really serious problem for our state. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Shaw, who will talk a little bit about the process, uh, and then it'll be followed by some others who'd like to speak as well. Okay. Thanks, Speaker Boss. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to announce that Wisconsin is about to dramatically transform the way that juvenile corrections are handled in our state. There's been a great deal of work that's been done in other states that have proven that reforms that are fair, effective, and evidence-based have a greater chance uh, to provide positive outcomes for youth that are involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, our goal should not only uh, focus on positive outcomes for youth, uh, but also provide enhanced public safety while making the best use of tax dollars. In 2013, New York passed the Close to Home Initiative, which allows juveniles who have committed non-serious crimes to be placed in residential care facilities closer to their homes. It keeps youth closer to their families, creating positive connections to their communities while also providing a continuum of services which include supervision, treatment, and humane confinement uh, to ensure an appropriate level of care while keeping the public safe. I've been extremely impressed, as Speaker Voss stated, uh, and proud of the bipartisan efforts from both Democrats and Republicans uh, as we've worked together on this issue. Both sides have uh, been at the table to provide major feedback, and there's been a strong willingness to work together uh, with each other and with stakeholders. And as Speaker Boss stated, that's something that we don't see a lot in this building. Um, I go back to uh, a tour early in the session that members of the Assembly Corrections Committee took to Lincoln Hills. 
and I sat with Representative Goyke and Representative Bowen and myself, and we sat down with some of the youth there, uh, it became evident that uh, a number of those juveniles were being failed by the system. Um, several of the young men that we spoke with were there for the second or third time, uh, virtually no involvement from family members. And then more recently, Representative Goyke and I toured the Racine Juvenile uh, Corrections Facility, and we saw that different programs, such as the ACE program, were having extremely positive results with much lower recidivism rates than simply incarceration at Lincoln Hills. So I'd like to go over just a couple of the main points of the bill and then turn it over uh, to the other members that were involved uh, in this whole process and then uh, open it up for questions. Um, first of all, you know, I think we really need to applaud Governor Walker's leadership in uh, going and seeing the, the benefit of going to a, a more local model for juveniles under the Department of Corrections and expanding that model by encouraging counties to do the same. Uh, youth who have been committed, uh, who have committed serious juvenile offenses or SJOs um, that have been waived into adult court will still be under the Department of Corrections. Um, Governor Walker is also working on his plan for DOC uh, facilities uh, for juveniles that will be smaller and closer uh, to home. So right now, if a juvenile is sentenced to more than a year, no matter how serious the offense is, Lincoln Hills is really the only choice. A number of counties, uh, as Speaker Voss stated, have innovative programs for youth which last less than a year, and I think it's important to build on those successes. Under our plan, counties can establish a secure residential care center for children and youth who need a secure facility for longer than a year. Um, this will keep the youth closer to family and community, and our plan offers grants to help build the facility. The youth will be under the supervision of the County Department of Health Services with the oversight from the Department of Children and Families. Um, funding is very important, uh, so grants will be available to establish the secure residential care centers, and youth aids will be uh, made more flexible uh, to be available for ongoing expenses. Um, counties have to make a plan. Uh, they can either establish their own secure residential center, they can partner with other counties to establish one, or uh, contract to place their youth with another county. Um, two committees will be formed. The Juvenile Correction Study Committee will review, research, and make recommendations. The Department of Children and Families will use these recommendations to promulgate rules uh, for the SRCs. The Juvenile Corrections Grant Committee will approve grant applications. These grants will have to be approved by the Joint Finance Committee. Um, the timeline on this is, is very tight. And if Lincoln Hills and Copper Lakes is to close by July 2020, there isn't any time to lose. Um, just a quick overview of the timeline. September of this year, uh, the uh, study committee will report uh, to, the, uh, to the Department of Children and Families. Uh, by December of this year, Department of Children and Families will promulgate rules. Uh, March of 2019, uh, we'll look at the preliminary grant applications from counties. July 2019, the grant committee uh, will submit their plan to the Joint Finance Committee. And then July of 2020, Lincoln Hills will be closed uh, and all the youth transferred. So at this point, um, I'll hand it over to uh, Representative Bowen, Representative uh, Bowen and Goyke. And the other people that were involved. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Shaw. Uh, it is an uh, honor to be a part of the Corrections Committee as ranking member um, for the Assembly Democrats, and uh, it is a part is honor to be a part of this process, this bipartisan process, uh, for both of us to come together. Um, a special thank you to Speaker Voss for uh, opening up his office for us to be able to have a candid conversation about moving our system in a new direction. Um, and that is exactly what this bill does. Um, first off, I want to make sure I recognize um, Representative Cleefish uh, because he was a, uh, a lending an ear uh, to a uh, issue that um, I think he has uh, been on top of for quite some time. Um, he objected to uh, the change of closing the uh, facilities in the southern part of the state at Ethan Allen, and uh, he is also uh, adhere to the call of 
making sure that we open back our secure residential care centers for children and youth, our SRCCCYs. Um, it is on the statute already, and uh, we wanted to forge forward to at least make sure that this was an option for judges. Uh, not only is that a part of this bill, but we are now telling counties to partner with us in uh, creating uh, these facilities that we know are way more evidence-based, that are way more uh, effective at saving lives and saving money. Um, I also want to make sure that we uh, recognize the advocates um, all over the state, um, especially in, in our, town, our part of the state in Milwaukee, Youth Justice Milwaukee, uh, being very active on this issue and uh, demanding a new direction um, for the betterment of our young people, for the betterment of the future of our state. Uh, it reminds me of Marcus Williams, uh, who was once incarcerated at Lincoln Hills, now a college student in our UW system. Uh, he represents the, the future of us creating more of that great outcome of young people being on the wrong track but getting them back on the right track. Um, and we will be able to do that through this bill, partnering with counties, providing more options for them to come to us, to the state, and saying what options would you like to provide and doing it on an evidence-based uh, manner. So um, I'm definitely excited. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of the group that you see behind me, and uh, I want to make sure that I also recognize the amount of dollars that we will save. Uh, there are millions of dollars that will be able to be saved on the county level. Um, as you know, Milwaukee has a, a majority of the young people uh, that are incarcerated at Lincoln Hills, and especially for Milwaukee County, we are excited that we'll be able to repurpose uh, dollars and save dollars. Uh, while saving lives at the same time. Uh, Representative Goyke. Uh, thank you. I want to add uh, two comments today, one that is uh, looking backwards and one that is looking forward. So I join Representative Bowen in, Bowen in saying thank you to all of my neighbors and constituents that sat through countless town halls, meetings in church basements, rallies on courthouse steps, calling for change in the juvenile correction system. I also want to acknowledge and say thank you. It's a little odd that a politician gets up here in this room and says thank you to the press. Uh, but there are a number of men and women in the press that are here today that refused to allow the conditions of incarcerated youth to die as a story in the state of Wisconsin. And so to all of you that fought for inches in your columns to report on abuses at Lincoln Hills, I say thank you because in all honesty, we are in part reacting to the call that you helped uh, issue. Now moving forward, the most important outcome that comes from this plan is that juvenile crime goes down. The most important outcome to the block that I live on in the central city of Milwaukee is that crime will be reduced. And that is something that we talk a lot about in this building, especially in the committees that I serve on. And so uh, going forward, this press conference and this bill are a good first step, but they are not the end. This ends with a signature from the governor, passage by the state senate and the assembly as a whole, and then it continues throughout the summer and fall and next year as the planning locally takes root. So this is an important first step, but it is by no means the end, and I look forward to standing uh, with my colleagues that are here today and others in support of this great plan. It's my pleasure to introduce a fellow Milwaukeean uh, who needs no introduction, Senator Lena Tate. Well, first of all, let me thank all of you for being here, and I want to join Representative Goyke in saying I surely appreciate those of you who wrote stories, those of you who continue to beat the drum so that the issues for the voiceless, frankly, were heard. But I also want to thank the guy behind me, Representative Crowley. I'll get the Davids mixed up. I almost said Bowen. <laughs> Representative Crowley, because we were siloed all doing work, the people you see here and even others that are not in this room, we were siloed. And because of his leadership, he made a reach out to Speaker Voss. And Speaker Voss opened up his conference room and we then came in that room and we began to have conversations as everyone has told you. I'm excited because as you know, I've been beating this drum for more than a decade. I probably sound like a broken record to some of you um, in regards to these issues around criminal justice and in particular, the issues around juvenile justice and Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake. I appreciate 
that the motions that I did during finance and those of you who have the pleasure of sitting through finance all the time um, in uh, the media core um, understand that. But the motions that we did in finance are many of the things that you see in this piece of legislation that we've worked on. I appreciate that Representative Goyke saw that regional piece and moved forward with that and continued to beat the drum. I appreciate that Representative um, Clayfish and Representative Bowen also saw pieces of that and took those pieces and moved forward. But in the end, we are best when we're together. And what I feel with this is that we are moving in that direction. And we're hoping to move this all the way through to the timelines that Representative Schraw has said. In the end, the things that were important to me was to make sure that there was a repeal of that a male juvenile facility needed to be north of Highway 29. It was crucial for me that Milwaukee County had to have authority to be able to have a facility. And who knew that we already had on the books, except the drafters, thank goodness for them and whoever brought it up, um, facilities that could be used that judges were not using that were secure facilities. So thank goodness for that. And that was important for me that we also moved juvenile corrections to show a different state of mind, that we move juvenile corrections to DCF and really a partnership with DCF and DHS and arguably even DPI since the education piece is there. Um, it was also important that the counties get flexibility. That was one of the main things that the county spoke about and that we help them with whatever building would happen. And so very candidly, um, I believe that we have something and a template that we could use maybe on some other hard issues in the state, but we're, we've rolled up our sleeves and we're moving forward. And so I appreciate that there is a bipartisan desire to move this bill and to move forward. And very candidly, no one's really concerned about who's getting credit. We're concerned about creating the change. Thank you for being here. Questions? Will the counties continue to pay for the serious juvenile offenders that will be housed in the state facilities? They don't, no. Current law, the right. state. Serious, when a, when, a, when a juvenile is determined to be a serious juvenile offender, that's a juvenile of 14 years old or more that is adjudicated or found guilty of a crime, an A, B, or C felony, the highest levels, those are under state uh, payment now. The state is taking, they supervise them, the DOC supervises them, supervises them and pays for their housing. And the state, the will continue to pay for the uh, other types of offenders, the lesser offenses, is that right? Correct, and, correct. And will those rates be set by the state? Will they be lower than they are today? Will they differ from one county to the next? Each, each. So, Actually, yeah. so the goal is to say that each county would have the flexibility to create their own enterprise, their own way to do it. You might have some that have differing programs, but the goal would be to have them currently paid for by the counties, but really the state sets the rates, but the counties would set those own individual rates. So they could contract with each other if you thought you had a better program for one youth that might work in a different facility. Um, the, if a child was in the non-SJO category and they were classified going to one of the state-run facilities, it'd be a very similar process to how it is now. This plan is different in some ways than the one that the governor um, laid yes. out. Do you have buy-in from him and do you have buy-in from Senate Republicans. Yeah, Senator Wangard was involved in our process. Um, uh, I, he was not able to be here. So we are continuing to reach out. We've met with the counties Association. I think as was mentioned, we've met with many of the stakeholders. Um, if there are other ideas that people have to improve the bill, um, I'm open to those. I think all of us are, because we want to make sure that this is the best possible product. Uh, we have been working closely with Governor Walker's administration. They gave us some feedback. Uh, they got a copy of the final draft of the bill last week, and I think they had uh, expressed openness to say it seems like a good concept, but they wanted to review some of the details, and that's why we reserve the right to say if they bring up good, legitimate issues to make the bill even better, we would certainly welcome those, but I think the general idea is that we are all on the same page. How would the education services be provided? The, the way that they're presently provided now, the way that education services are presently provided, it depends on where the facility is. So Lincoln Hills, for example, or if 
in a county, a juvenile detention facility is in a certain area, whatever school district it's in. So those things would be similar. The goal would be, however, to make sure that programming is very much mental health based and trauma informed care based. And then to answer a question that was brought up earlier, part of the reason for the flexibility in the youth aids is so that hopefully it would provide some preventative work that could happen up front so that we could also um, allow counties uh, the ability to use their funding that they presently have a little different. Um, there is a part of um, the youth aids that the county has to pay for juveniles that um, I believe are even um, affiliated that um, with um, state facilities. But the larger piece that I think we have to say is that we're not going to um, leave the counties fully hanging um, by themselves and that's why we're giving the flexibility because the counties were concerned that if they take juveniles that would have been in the state facility that now they're going to have additional responsibility financial responsibility that they didn't want to take on so the flexibility we're hoping does that as well as they've done as Speaker Boss has said in Racine they've done it less expensive than we do it at the state facility and very candidly the state facility is more than it looks like because we put GPR in it to backfill Yeah, they, they already do that now, so I would not anticipate that it would be different. And I believe uh, that the state provides some funding to yeah. help with those costs. So they the do. goal, once again, is to make sure that there's not an undue burden on a community that would choose to host one of these facilities, because we want no incentive, mm -hmm. uh, or we want no detriment uh, to say somebody wouldn't want one of the facilities. And that's one of the reasons that we mentioned DPI earlier, because they are kind of in the midst of it because of the very things that you've asked. Much less. Yeah, the, our goal is to have it be less expensive and hopefully uh, provide additional flexibility. So that's why we want to see the proposals. Uh, you'll see in the draft that we want to do two things. Number one, we want to look at all of the state facilities that we already have to make sure that there are not existing facilities that could either not be retrofitted or be utilized in a better way so we don't need to necessarily build brand new facilities. I think most of us would assume that there does need to be an expansion at the facility at Mendota. Uh, they only, I believe, is it 12, 12 beds, 20 beds, but it's a relatively small number, and the goal would be to expand that facility because we know the need is there. Uh, there's a facility in my district, Southern Oaks Girls School, which was dramatically remodeled uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that I would like to at least have them look and say, can we use a facility that we have that can either be retrofitted or done in a less expensive way before we create a brand new one that the taxpayer would have to duplicate. So our goal is to have it be less expensive, but more uh, potentially um, uh, focused on the acute care at the local level. So the counties are gonna have to put together a plan. We also have in the proposal an incentive for them to cooperate so we don't have 72 different facilities. We envision maybe half a dozen around the state where counties would cooperate together to try to put together the best programming at the lowest cost. Uh, and that's why we also there say, let's look at the potential for existing facilities to do it less expensively while also maintaining that quality of the programming. So you might have some brand new facilities. You might have some that are retrofitted uh, and hopefully at a lower cost than just building five brand new facilities without regard to the potential uses that we already have. So does the bill appropriate money or bonding authority or is that left to joint finance? No. If you look at our plan, you will see that it's actually more about taking the next year to do the appropriate planning to make sure that we do it right. Uh, I think the consensus that we all had was we know there's a problem, we want to have a timeline, but we don't want to also rush into it without knowing exactly what we're going to spend and the best way to do so. So the two committees that Representative Shra talked about uh, would take the time over the course of that timeline so that by the next governor, uh, when Governor Walker puts his budget together, he'll have an opportunity to put the bonding in, hopefully based on what counties are looking for, how much is actually needed, as opposed to just a, a kind of a blank check. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, thanks everybody. Good job.